Casual Diary Podcast, Episode 212. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today. And here's why. Because oftentimes, when you are inspired with an idea, you first of all wonder, will it work at all, let alone are you even open to the idea that your idea might grow bigger than you originally planned and become an opportunity for other people as well? I mean, for most of us, when we're starting out, we're looking for a way just to take care of our own family. But occasionally, we should be open to the idea that our idea could be bigger than us and most importantly, provide more value to more people than we may have otherwise originally intended and become a solution for other families as well. And you know what? Today's guest will be an excellent example and case study in understanding that I have with me today, none other than Matt Miller. His company is School Spirit Vending. And here's the cool thing I like about this, is that it started as a simple side business with one gumball machine. One gumball machine. You know that little machine in the corner that your kid is always bugging you to go and put the quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies in. This started there and has now raised over $3 million for education over the last few years. Now, what I really like is the number of pivots that he's made. First, he's served in our military as an Air Force pilot, and he's also been an ad executive. But now he is a business man, if you will, and he practices what he calls unbusiness, and we're definitely going to find out about it. So help me welcome Matt Miller. Matt, you there? I'm here, Jay. Glad to be here. Thanks for taking the time uh, for, you know, your busy schedule and sharing with us some of the things that you've been able to accomplish. Now, for those who have listened a long time, they know the first question I'm about to ask you. You may not know, but that's okay. It's not going to hurt, I promise. Uh, I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs, of which, obviously, you are one, a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, you can pick a superhero. Do you have a favorite superhero? You know, actually, it's kind of funny you say that. Um, I, I would have to say Superman, ultimately, but uh, it's kind of interesting. I actually started a superhero comic series here a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that's a side note, something else we do for our schools as well. But I'd have to say Superman. Superman. Okay, we'll go with Superman. Well, just like, you know, Superman. Uh, he he has an origin story, but more importantly, he, he uses his special ability to help people. And that's, I think, what entrepreneurs do. We use our special ability to help people. Uh, but before, you know, Superman discovered his ability to fly and, you know, x-ray vision and all these types of things, he was just a regular good old boy from Krypton. And <laughs> at the end of the day, he had to make a decision to use those skills in a certain way. But b before we get too far down this road, what we want to know is, you know, before the Air Force, before the ad exec, before, you know, helping schools and, and raising millions of dollars, before even creating opportunities for other people, who is Matt Miller? Wow. Well, first off, I definitely do not leap small, uh, tall buildings with a single <laughs> bound. Uh, it doesn't take just kryptonite to, uh, uh <laughs> to set me back, but, um, I grew up in the Chicago area, uh, was a, uh, oldest of four, ended up going to the air force Academy for college and, um, was blessed to have an opportunity to go to the Air Force and fly upon graduation. Flew in the Air Force for nine years, had a blast doing it, 
um, was an Air Force instructor pilot for six years and then transitioned to fly what's called the C-5 Galaxy, which is one of the largest airplanes in the world, and flew that all over the world for, for three years' time. Enjoyed my time flying, but believe it or not, was not something I wanted to do my entire life. I just kind of happened into that because I went to the academy for school. Um, so I was ready to get out and, and make my own way in the world of business. Started out working in the medical industry for about a year and a half and then transitioned into the ad world and spent just shy of 11 years there. While I was in the ad space, I had some really, really great success very early on in my career. I ended up being number two in the country out of 750 reps my first full year. Uh, And uh, unfortunately, whereas that brought me a lot of success and accolades, my boss did not think that I deserved them so quickly. So year number two, I became went from a hero to a zero as she increased my quota 96%. Um, (laughs) The average quota increase was uh, 5 to 10%, just to put it in perspective. So we got put in a major hole. In fact, uh, that cost me about 80 grand that next year. And we went from doing fairly well to being in a world of hurt. And all I had to do, Jay, is look at the compensation plan that was established to know there was no chance of me digging myself out of that hole anytime soon. So I started looking to do some other things on the side. And that's where the whole idea of a gumball machine and ultimately what I do today in schools came about. Wow. So workplace politics is the result is how you got your push. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. So I, I'm curious before, be, I'm not familiar with the C5. I've seen more C130s, but what did you fly other than the C5? Uh, it's called the T38. It's a little two seat tandem supersonic trainer that the Air Force uses to train students how to fly in their second six months of the year long pilot training program. We focus primarily in you know, formation flying and that type of thing. To give you an idea, uh, one time we went cross country, me and my but one of my buddies who was another instructor pilot for the weekend. The drive from San Ant- Lubbock, Texas to San Antonio is about five and a ha- half hours. In the T-38, we made it in about 22 minutes. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so should I call you Maverick from now on or, or, or do you, is, was, what was the, did you have a call sign? Better looking, but no, uh, (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I I like it. I love it. I love it. I love it. My, my nickname was actually mattress, believe it or not. Um, at the air force Academy, my roommate, I'd come back from class and I'd always be taking a nap after class was over. And so my roommate and another buddy of mine started calling me mattress that eventually morphed into just stress for short. Um, So that was kind of, it wasn't a call sign, but that was a nickname through that entire period of my life. That's pretty funny. Pretty funny. A a little known side note for most people listening, you probably don't know this. I actually tried to go into the Air Force because I wanted to be a pilot as well. And I heard something I I rarely hear. I was too short, Um, meaning my torso was too short and my legs were too long in order to be the pilot, but that's okay. Little trivia for those of you who've been listening for a while. <laughs> um, it's just interesting. I'm glad you got to go. I'm glad you got to go. And thank you for serving. Now, I- I'm curious, though, through all of the experiences between, you know, the pilot and the ad exec and the brief sent and the medical, did do you believe that any of what you went through before, any of those skill sets that maybe you learned in the military or and any of those other things help you today in what it is that you currently do? Oh, no doubt about it. Uh, number one on the list is discipline. You know, whether I wanted to be disciplined or not, when I showed up day one of basic training at the Air Force Academy, I learned how to discipline myself or else I was going to be disciplined. <laughs> so, um, um, <clears throat> That was a that was a major part of of it all. You know, the other thing is just persisting. I think through hardship, um, 
you know, my motto ended up being during much of my career there at the academy, they can make it harder, but they can't make it longer. Meaning, you know, basic training was only so many days and we had to graduate. They couldn't just arbitrarily extend it another week or two. So I knew they could make it really, really hard. But all I had to do is was make it through that period of time and get through and, and move on. And so I, I, in a lot of cases, you know, hung on that, um, that calendar, that time frame, um, because oftentimes it was pretty brutal and was not fun to be a part of a lot of that. <laughs> you mean the, the military wasn't all about a party and, and, and fun and relaxation? What? No, no, (laughs) no, totally understood. I I mean, and and many people have heard the phrase, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And I I think that's a very important thing, because as an entrepreneur, there can be seasons where it's tough, but you need to know that the only difference is, is that at least with basic training, you knew what the end date was. Yep, exactly. So um, I, I'm curious, when it comes to, you know, taking in all of this, so you, you've, you've got your background and then there comes this moment where you're, I guess you're, you're doing your ad executive thing and how on earth do you come up with the idea for a gumball machine? Like, what were you doing that says, I know, I'm going to go get a gumball machine? You know, I had read... Uh, Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad Jay a couple of years before. And so I started doing a bunch of things business wise on the side. I'd done some multi level stuff. I had uh, sold books online on Amazon and Elite. Libris and half.com for a while. In fact, my, my garage at one point in time literally looked like a library with different aisles of used <laughs> books. I had collected aluminum cans. I had done all those types of things, but, but I measured every single one of those businesses, even though they were very profitable against what Kiyosaki talked about as far as the whole residual and passive income side of things. And I was just creating another job for myself with that stuff. So I was continuing to look for a way to to do something passively. Unfortunately, I could not afford to uh, to own my own house at the time, let alone have rental properties or that type of thing. So I was stuck at something at a much smaller level. And I was with a buddy of mine at church. We were in in between Sunday school and church one day, and he mentioned how he and his young daughters had bought a couple of gumball machines, and that it was something they could do together, and and they were learning about making money and business, and and I remember that conversation. So I started looking into the whole vending side of things because it was something that I could do on the side, moonlighting outside of my full time career, that I could work on nights and weekends and vacation time to put together, and. So I had to start small. I literally had about $100 at the time. I spent about half of that on educating myself in, with eBooks on Amazon. And then I found a used $32 candy and gumball machine on eBay from a guy across Houston. So I didn't even have to pay for shipping. And so I'll never forget, I won that auction. I loaded up my two youngest kids in the car, my 98 Honda Accord at the time on a Saturday and we drove across town and I picked up my first machine, was able to pick this guy's brain about what he had done, found out that he had 19 other machines in his garage that he wanted to get rid of and uh, convinced him into holding on to them and letting me come back and buy them over the next couple of months as I had the cash to do it. So I started literally with one machine and I cash flowed the entire business from there. Uh, it, it was a very patient and painstaking process because of the financial position I was in, but I didn't have any other options. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the word patient about that because occasionally that's not my strong suit. Uh, I don't know many people who have ever called me patient, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, I, I can understand where that's the case. Now I, I've got a question cause I've always, I've, I have consistently thought about, you know, from time to time vending in various, uh, various purposes, but how does how do you get like how do you get somebody to let you put the vending machine in on their store? 
You know, there's a couple different ways that that type of vending is done. There's either the charity side of things or the, or there's the, the essential revenue share with a location. If it's a gumball machine or something like that, many operators will partner with a local charity or a national charity and a portion of the proceeds go to that charity and the location, they've got the space sitting there anyway. So they're, they're typically more than willing, um, to allow you to set up a a machine there when you're talking, you know, bigger setups and racks and toys and temporary tattoos and stickers and all that. Typically it's a revenue share of some kind with a location. Interesting. I had no idea. See, one of the things I I, I like about the concept of cash flow is that it's not limited to real estate. And today we're learning a lot about vending in a completely (laughs) different way. You know, that overpriced, stuffed toy in the middle of the claw that you can never grab uh you're telling me that that's that's a revenue share model and i like it yep and now are you any good at these vending games like do you actually win when you you, from your own machine i well i i don't use i don't do cranes oh okay um i i kept things simple one thing i learned this is going to sound really stupid seeing that i flew the second largest airplane in the world in the C5. But Jay, I don't even know how to change the oil in my car. So, <laughs> so for me to, to, you know, uh, start working with vending machines with circuit boards and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm not the guy to do that. In fact, when we still lived in a rental place, uh, our family, my wife would have been a perfect customer of Rent a husband, which was a franchise in our area that was essentially um, a company that came in and did all kinds of handyman tasks around the house because <laughs> I wasn't that guy. So when I knew myself well enough to realize that I was, if I was going to get involved in vending, number one, I didn't have a lot of money, but number two, it had to be something that even Matt could understand. And uh, so mechanical equipment with uh, gumball machines and, and sticker machines and that type of thing was simple enough that even I could figure out. Well, this brings up a great point. This brings up a great point because oftentimes when considering an idea for a business, we look at our existing quote unquote inventory of skill sets and go, well, I don't know how to do that. So that's not something that I can do. What I'm hearing is that there's a part of this, there was a learning curve for you, especially from the mechanical side, uh, in order to either repair or fix or keep these machines going properly. Oh, huge learning curve. And once again, they're built like a tank, most of them. They'll last forever. But on occasion, they require maintenance just like anything. And I could figure out a small quarter mechanism or 50 cent mechanism, but... You know, when you're talking the cranes and and a lot of the skill games and that type of thing, um, I, I'm sure it's real simple once you have an understanding of it. And I'm sure in many cases it's literally swapping out a circuit board or whatever to fix a problem. But I'm just I'm, I'm not patient. I'm not that guy. It, well, I'm patient, but not in that way. I'm not that guy to to spend time to figure it out. And once again, getting back to where I was at the very beginning, I definitely didn't have thousands of dollars to invest in one machine somewhere uh, versus what I was doing that I could literally put 20 to 30 machines out for that same thousand dollars, machines that I could understand how to operate. Got it. Now, for, for those that are curious like me and possibly to prevent me from getting this email, we're, we're kind of trying to understand because when it comes to a rental property, we get the cash outlay, we understand how the, the cash flow, et cetera, happens. But are you like, what is the typical, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the economics behind it. I mean, it's a gumball machine and it's a quarter. And how frequently do, do people really, really come and get gumballs? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, check this out, Jay. I My kids were never kids that would use the vending machines. So I was that guy that when I first came with the idea, I was like, okay, so really, are there people actually using these things? Mm -hmm. Um, The National Bulk uh, Vending Association, actually, actually Vending Times has a annual um, census of the vending industry. And I think the last year that I read was a couple years ago, the average gumball machine does about $12 a month um, in revenue. So that is... uh, 96 gumballs in that one location over the span of 30 days. 
Okay. Um, the the margins are enormous. Uh, a gumball costs two and a half or three cents. So oh, wow. you, you're making, you know, potentially a thousand percent on that money. So, uh, and there's guys that literally have thousands of gumball machines uh, around cities and states and, uh, and they live off of that. Um, you don't think of it as real money, but it is, and it's extremely profitable. Okay. I just want to make sure I heard this right. You just told me that a gumball is two and a half cents. Yep. And I've been paying a quarter. Yep. Oh no. <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of this. I am on. So what you're really telling me is a gumball in a location is easy to grow. Cause you just got to wait a month. Cause the, you said the machine was only $30. Are you listening to this? I mean, those silly gumball machines, man. It makes you just wonder how simple is business really? Or more importantly, how complicated do we make it when we don't even have to make it as complicated? It could be simple as gum and vending and all of these things, nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies at a time. Who knew? I know I didn't. And hopefully you are getting a new idea of how cash flow can be created because that's kind of what we do is bring these things to you so that you have the ability to understand how you might have a shot at going out there to do it. Obviously, if you want to get involved in real estate investing, if you've ever considered it, we can help you there. If you want to get some, take your real estate investing to the next level, we can help you there. If you want to learn to raise the capital, we can help you there. In fact, go ahead and send a text message. Text book to 72,72000. Again, that's text the word book to 72000. And I will get you a complimentary copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. We use a lot of real estate examples that'll help you be able to build any business, but specifically real estate. And if that's something you're looking for, go for it. And by the way, if you are Outside the U.S., you can just go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. And you'll be able to get the exact same thing. Let's get back to it and see how much more gum we can chew with Matt. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting a mid-level machine today, I, I got mine used but if you're getting a mid-level level machine today, you know, you're into it for $100 maybe. Um, and that's a machine that is going to last you for a very, very, very long time from one of the top manufacturers in the industry. Uh, so, you know, what's, what's, your, uh, what's your time horizon for recouping that investment? What, you know, nine months, something like that? It, it's a very short period of time. And you know, the numbers aren't huge. So because of that, a lot of people don't pay attention to it. But, but trust me, you know, I've built, I've built my life. I walked away from a corporate job and before that, an Air Force, you know, being a pilot to do this, um, it, it can be very lucrative. You know, I, I like this play because it's under the radar. I mean, no one really knows and sees i mean this is operating is this is like that subtext that it's just kind of secretly going all along and it's been there for quite some time so um do you i mean if gumballs are today costing you two and a half cents um is there really like inflation worries in your business at all i'm like your supply your 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 costs of 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 product doesn't if it's two and a half cents today it, it doesn't sound like it's been increasing no uh, i mean there's always that concern you know in the long term if if you know things go to complete you know what like some people predict but um if that happens we're all in a lot lot worse hurt than than me worrying about you know my return on my gumballs well <laughs> you know? it, 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 true true but here's what it, here's what i really am trying to say and i hope everybody is listening most businesses have the exact inverse their cost of goods is increasing faster than their price that they can charge for the product and it sounds like to me you have the exact inverse of that it's happening your cost of goods may be going up but the price you can charge for that same good is so high and so well and above everything else it doesn't really it's you you're not 
quote unquote, feeling that pinch. Because oftentimes, you know, when lumber goes up, my rehabs are more expensive, labor goes up, all of these things are more expensive, but it doesn't necessarily mean the property rents or sells for more. Uh, and you can experience this squeezing of margins, but I am so not hearing that right now. Well, here's the thing, Jay. You can adjust, whether the market will bear it or not, on a rental or whatever, you can adjust price. With a vending machine, I can't. You know, my mechanism is a 25 cent mechanism. Now, I could I could I change it to a 50 cent mech? Eventually, yes, but there's not a 30 cent mechanism. There's not a 35 cent mechanism. So everything has to jump in an increment of a quarter. And because of that, the suppliers to the industry understand that I see. And, do, and do all they can to, to maintain as best as possible the costs because – there's only so much uh, decrease in margin that I can absorb, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that totally understood. Totally understood. Okay, so we we clearly established that uh, we w- there's room, there's a business here that that that's definitely for vending. Uh, I, what I would love to know though is a little bit about what I call that superhero moment, that moment where you realize, okay, I can go do this like full time and offer this to people and, and, and those types of things. And for most in entrepreneurs, they were doing something else and they had to let go of something in order to go take on something else. But in, in during that process, there's a bit of a struggle uh, occasionally. So uh, I'm curious to hear if there was any sort of that struggle for you. Oh, big time. Because, you know, I talked to you about the hole I was in financially. Well, what ended up happening next is is we got in such a bad situation over the next several years to where I literally got turned down at a payday loan place to borrow a couple bucks to or a couple hundred bucks to pay a bill. Now, you don't have to have a credit rating at a payday loan place, but you do have to have a bank statement that shows that you didn't have any overdrafts or any bank uh you know, fees charged to your account the month prior. And I had three different overdrafts the the month prior uh, during my lowest period of time financially. So I had to work my way out of all that. And it was tough because here I was, you know, quote unquote, America's finest, you know, Mr. Top Gun, whatever. (laughs) And, and, And here I can't even pay my bills. But I knew that I was in a circumstance that was out of my control in a lot of ways. And even though I was in that circumstance, it was not a true reflection of me. It was just a snapshot of my life. So I knew if I got steady and, and, and kept my ears to the ground to figure out the the right opportunity and continued to work with blinders on that, I would eventually find it. And what happened was our, the, the gumball and candy and toy business that I had in the Houston area continued to grow uh, it wasn't long and I, I had about 150 locations, but then 07 and 08 hit and less people were going out to eat, less people were, were putting quarters in my machines and I was frustrated. Oh. And that's when I had four kids come knocking on my door in the span of a couple of weeks selling me stuff for their local school. And I was like, you know, maybe there's a way I can get some kids off the street because I didn't know any of those kids. They didn't have their parents with them. So essentially they were, you know, being door-to-door salespeople for the local school. And being a father with young kids at the time, that bothered me. So I thought, well, maybe I can tie my my knowledge of printing on the ad in the ad space with my knowledge of vending, and we could start selling mascot stickers in schools and, and, you know, promoting school spirit and that type of thing. So that's where the whole idea of school spirit vending came about and the pivot from gumballs and and traditional business locations to schools. Nice. I love it. And hopefully for all of us listening, you can hear the seeds of, uh, of how it was planted, how it was layered. And most importantly, the decision to persevere, even though you may not know where it's heading. And even more importantly than that, and I know for all of us, myself included, there are times where you just got to go one day at a time because you, you don't know. But you just know the only thing you do know is I got to keep going forward. I may not have much of a plan other than I'm going to get through today, but that sometimes is all you got to be able to move forward and get to the next step. And then boom, kids knock on your door. 
<laughs> so that could be the very, very case. So, help you know, us. Jay, yeah, go ahead. Jay, let me let me just say this: success is when oppor- opportunity and preparedness meet. Indeed. And I was spending a lot of time not realizing it, but I was spending a lot of time getting prepared. Um, I didn't know that God was going to totally change the direction of what I was doing. But if I hadn't been active, if I hadn't been busy doing something, learning and, and just being out there in the marketplace, I would not have prepared for that moment when when the opportunity came along. Well, and indeed, not only would you not have been prepared, I think you wouldn't have been educated enough to even understand it. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, Most of us think, you know, there's a difference between education and schooling. And the purpose of education is to teach you and I to recognize opportunity. And I've had kids knock on my door. I've also been to, uh, you know, vending machines. I've never thought of somehow merging those two things because that that (laughs) type of opportunity doesn't – I don't see that. But you did, and it's only because of all of those other things in the past, and you you merged them two together. So for those that are wondering now – Tell us a little bit about, you know, school spirit vending and exactly what you guys do for for a school. Well, what we do is we provide a passive fundraiser for the school. One of the biggest challenges today in the school environment is that they are always in need of money. They're always having to fundraise on top of the taxes that are collected or what have you. And that fundraising requires volunteers. And as more and more families require both parents to be working in order to just keep a roof over their head, there's fewer and fewer volunteers available to the school to help out with those types of things. So with our program, we provide a hassle-free year-round fundraising program that they don't have to do any work for. We literally come in and do all the work for them. On the business side, with our franchise, we teach people how to implement our program and develop passive income for themselves as well while supporting local education in the process. It ends up being a win-win-win scenario. We bring somebody in literally at the top of the vending world with what we do. And of course, we've got a turnkey system that has been developed over the last eight years to where someone can walk in with no no knowledge of what we do whatsoever in a matter of a month or two be as, you know, up and running and, and doing amazing things in their local area. So, and, and so that we're clear when you're, you're talking about the, the vending in schools and, and to prevent uh, a, a number of, of uh, emails, what would be the types of products that you actually have in the vending machine? We actually sell stickers. Excellent. Believe it or not, kids love stickers. Oh, I, I, hmm, I know. I, I, <laughs> I have my daughters. Between the stickers and these temporary tattoos, uh, I don't know which they, they spend more time uh, involving themselves with. But they, <laughs> they definitely – oh, I've seen – I see them. Uh, every time they go to grandma's house, they come back with a few more. So I, I, totally, I totally get that. So you're telling me then you've built a vending business all around stickers in schools. Yes. I love it. See, only in America, <laughs> <Can> you, <laughs> you know, those are the things that that are there. Now, does a stick is a, uh, now, uh, don't don't hurt me too bad, but is a sticker more or less expensive than a gumball? Oh, it's more expensive. Okay, uh, all right. The mar the margins aren't as good for stickers, okay. but they're still but they're still not bad. Well, th- that's true. That's true. That's true. Okay, I get it. Now, for someone to Actually, because you mentioned the school, so I'm assuming then the the sticker still probably costs a quarter or 50 cents or whatever, and you're saying a percentage of that revenue goes to the school, and obviously a percentage goes back to the operator, That, if I understand it correctly. In its simplest form, that's what it is. Yes. Does it ever get any more complicated than that? No, and that's that's the beauty of our program. It is is wildly simple. Uh, Most of our – the folks in our business – either come from other business backgrounds or are busy professionals. And we show them how on a limited time commitment, they can implement our program and, uh, you know, literally put together a cash flow monster in no time on top of whatever they're currently doing. Very similar to real estate, just not, not as much leverage needed in most cases. Well, and that's exactly why you've got my attention and why I love talking about 
other forms of generating cash flow for people so that they don't think you always have to use real estate. Now, you said a couple of things that I want to add some relative me- that are relative measures that I want to add some concrete understanding to. You said a, a cash flow monster and you said in no time. In your definition, what is a cash flow monster and what is no time? Because other people, they're looking for solutions in various different ways. And no time to you might be exactly what they're looking for. Whereas if we go in with the incorrect expectation, we'd be like, man, it still hasn't worked yet. Right. I mean, to give, you know, I've, I can only give you my own personal experience. Sure. But I, I think it took me. 20, let's see, to add my first 20 locations, mind you, this was eight years ago when I got started. It took me about a year. Um, uh, for what we do, there's there's been a lot of people that have blown by that in, in the last few years because they've been able to stand on our shoulders. Right. But but those 20 locations literally have the, the potential to provide thousands of dollars a month in cash flow for somebody. Because of the franchise laws, I can't get into specific details. But, I mean, I, there's people on our team that do this exclusively and are doing very well for themselves. There's others that do it just as a, as a part-time gig just to be able to pay some bills or to be able to pay for vacation every year or whatever. So, um, we kind of have the gambit as far as success and, and the amount of time people want to put into this and dedicate to it. But, um, this business can be whatever they want to make of it if they're willing to put in the time and, and, and the energy to do it. Indeed. Indeed. And I, I think that's very true for, for most things, uh, is you get out what you put in. Uh, and except in this case, you, there's a proven model and system because I, and you, you have taken, I mean, don't get me wrong. When I, I remember being in, in, in school, I was that kid that would go buy the candy at volume and then sell it off one at a time. <laughs> right. that, that was me. Like I, and you know, you've taken that to a completely new level. <laughs> I'm just like, okay. So clearly that model works. You you just got better pricing, more consistent locations, and all of those types of things to be able to work it out. So I, I have an interesting question. Do do you or any of the individuals that you, you that uh, are working within your organization and franchises do they do this with their kids, and their kids go to that same school where the the machines are? Yes, they do it with their kids. I don't know specifics as far as the schools that a lot of them go to, though I do know we have machines in in many of the schools of the kids on our team. But our whole goal, or one of the goals, is is to allow people to put together a business they can build as a family. Um, you know, my goal with my, my kids was has been to teach them skills that they can utilize once they're out on their own and. Uh, our business has enabled them to to do that and to foster an environment for them to do that. We have many of our operators who now have their kids once they've turned 18 have decided to become um, part of our team themselves and have their own t- territories in different parts of the country. Nice. So it's really, really, really neat to see the family and the multi-generational business that, that we're developing. Um, you know, many env- environments, are not conducive for that. And, uh, family is the most important thing to me aside from my faith. So that, you know, was something that I wanted to make sure I incorporated in our business as much as possible from the very beginning. Totally understood and agreed, uh, with the family, with the faith. And I I have a question because I know for some of you, you're, if you think like I do, you're thinking big. You know, you guys know I'm an apartment house kind of guy because the single family houses are a little small. And it's like, I want to think big. So you, there was something you said at the beginning, Matt, that, that was important. You said that you were looking at, uh, you know, other things, but those other things would have turned into a, a different type of a job. So at, how does someone manage, like if, if someone in is listening and wants to or has the vision to have, and I'm just going to make up a number, 10,000 machines, how does that not become a job that they have to drive around town all day and change out gumball machines and mechanisms? Well, it's simple because by that point in time, you have an entire organization 
of route drivers and all that type of stuff that are there um, to do the day to day operations. Um, you know, if you've got somebody that's that's got ten thousand locations like that, you've got a, a pretty large organization that you've had to put together in support of that. Um, but once again, the business is very simple. It's not complicated. And so it's literally the, the duplication of the same steps over and over and over and over again um, over a number of years. And because of that, it, you know, it would be very simple for somebody to, to put together a team and to enable them to do something like that. Excellent. Perfect. I just wanted it said uh, in case someone was trying to think of a reason that they, they were like, well, I can't do it because... If I grow too big, then I'm going to end up with a job. And I, I had a feeling you were going to say something similar to what you said. I just wanted you to say it. Be- to, give, to give you an idea, Jay, I've got you know a guy on our team. He's got about 210 schools right now. And he works about five days a month. Um, he, he's got several route guys that do the majority of the work. He likes to keep his hand on the pulse. So he still works in many of his locations that are close and local to him so that he can do so, but he could just as easily tomorrow hire another person and literally not work in and out of any of his locations. Uh, That's, that's where I am today. I've got one route driver that handles all of my locations because my time is best spent today running the entire organization and being in the visionary for the future and, and what else that we do and how we do it uh, versus, you know, collecting quarters and and swapping out stuff stickers at this point yeah totally understood it makes perfect sense plus you you it, it's nice to have people who are keep their finger on the pulse now here's <laughs> here's an interesting question um how do you figure out what sticker to put in the machine you know the kids tell us that to be honest really um, there's a yeah i mean there's a lot of trends that we can follow that that are pretty easy to follow That's but funny. quite honestly Quite honestly, the quarters tell the story, and one of the real benefits to our program for somebody new is the fact we figured all that out. In fact, you know we have close to two thousand locations today that tell us exactly what the kids want on a daily basis with with those quarters. Um, in fact, we actually develop and print the majority of the stickers that are in our machines as well, because of the fact that. Um, uh, you know, the, the kids have very specific needs. And of course, in a school environment, there's very specific requirements about what is allowed, what's not, what is acceptable, what's not. So we've kind of taken over the entire implementation, logistics, and production process to where, you know, there aren't any questions for our operator. Um, we produce regular products on a month, you know, new products on a monthly basis. We do product testing. We do all those types of things to mitigate the risk as much as possible for our operators so that when they're purchasing a product, uh, they, they've got a pretty high likelihood of knowledge that it's going to sell. You know, uh, Matt, I, I think everyone right now is having a transformational paradigm shift and will never pass by another gumball machine and look at it the same way <laughs> ever again. So w- with all that being said, I, I know there's a, a more than a few who probably are interested in figuring out a little bit more, uh, possibly even exploring these opportunities for themselves. What's going to be the best way for them to track you down and figure out, hey, um, Tell me more about, you know, this, this, this whole vending thing. The best way to uh, track me down, Jay, is uh, uh, Matt, M-A-T-T, at SSV, as in school spirit vending business.com. And what I'd love to do, if you don't mind, is I'd love to make available to your audience an ebook that I put together. It's called Live Your Dreams, The Top 10 Reasons Why You Need to Start a Vending Business. And it just talks about the 10 reasons why why I think vending is a viable alternative uh, to derive, you know, secondary or multiple streams of income. Uh, your audience can get that at ssvbusiness.com forward slash CFD for cash flow diary. Awesome. And I thank you for that gift for sure. Now, one final question here for, you know, 
that that person. Let, let's pretend for a second that there's a person out there who's maybe standing in front of the superhero outfit store, picking out their cape and thinking of becoming one of these, you know, entrepreneurs that fly around and, and save people uh, using their special skill sets and talents. They they feel excited. However, they still have that voice in the back of their head. And you know that voice because you've heard it. However, uh, you you've also dealt with it, and but that voice is is can be persistent. It can be there, especially in the low times. It's it's loud, and it's and it causes hesitation, and and it can make someone doubt: Will this work? And is my idea any good? And can I do it? And all those types of things. My question to you, Matt, is: What would you say to a person who's having that experience right now? I would tell them: Get started today. Too many of us have knowledge constipation. We're getting ready to get ready to get ready to get started. And in the process, we're worrying our life away. Uh, You know, it's literally an excuse why not to get out of their comfort zone. Success is not comfortable, but the results are amazing. And um, I, I wouldn't wish some of the things I had to go through to get my business off the ground on anyone but I don't apologize for them because I learned a lot on along the way that quite honestly made me who I am today to enable me to run a very large team that's all across the country and to lead them. If I hadn't gone through some of the junk I went through, I, I wouldn't be able to do that today. So God has a reason why he's going to put you through some of those ups and downs. You just have to be willing to put your nose to the grindstone, do the work and make it happen and come out the other end so that you can ultimately see why he puts you through those things. Well said. Well said. I definitely want to thank you uh, for taking the time to to invest your knowledge, your expertise uh, here with the Cashflow Diary audience. I appreciate the opportunity, Jay, and God bless. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? It probably means that you, and you know who you are. You don't need me to tell you, but I'm going to say it anyway. Go over to the website. It's ssvbusiness.com forward slash CFD, cash flow diary, CFD. Get started if this resonated with you because you know what? Something needs to. We've brought many different ideas to the table. Hopefully you have found a way or finding more ways to find your little niche, your little piece of the pie so that you can begin to create a bigger, better life. And if nothing else, on this episode, you've all learned that many of us are constipated and need a laxative. So with that being said, (laughs) it's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.